Suppose we have P and tells Q, right? Now, what's the antecedent here? Well, the antecedent is the P. And so if you're saying you're denying the antecedent, what you're saying is not P. So whenever you have a conditional statement and you're denying the antecedent, you're also saying not P. However, the problem is this. You might want to conclude not Q. Take a look at the argument. P entails Q, not P, therefore not Q. Is that right? I mean, aren't there other ways of getting Q? What if we have one prime, that is premise one prime, that's W entails Q. Now, maybe it's true that not P, but aren't there other ways of getting Q? So how can we say not Q? In fact, this would be a fallacious argument, denying the antecedent. So one way to remember this fallacy is to think about what denying the antecedent means is to assert not P, not the antecedent. And then it would be fallacious to conclude not the consequent. Okay, here's an example. If you give a man a gun, he may kill someone. <laughs> now we have a picture here from the movie The Shining. Premise two, you do not give a man a gun. So you might say not P. Therefore, he will not kill someone. Not Q. I mean, if you don't focus on the symbolization, if you focus just on the natural language sentences here, you might be tempted to really think that it's the case that it's not Q. But what logic does for us is give us the tools to symbolize it. And hence, then becomes super clear that the argument is fallacious because not Q simply does not follow from premise one and two, right? Okay, any questions so far? All right, so here's another familiar Venn-esque diagram. This is P entails Q. When you're denying the antecedent, you're saying P entails Q as well as not P. Now we can use this diagram to illustrate the fallacy. Okay, if you say not P, what you're saying is you're not inside the circle here, right? However, you could be, when you're not P, you could be inside here or you could be out here. Now, if you're out here, then yeah, it's the case that not Q, but on the basis of premises one and two, you can't conclude that you're also outside of this orange circle. It may very well be the case that P entails Q and not P, yet you're found here or here or here. There are other ways of getting Q. Okay, so what can we do to show that this argument is invalid? Well, in addition to symbolizing it, we can use a truth table, and we've done this many times before. So here is the argument symbolized. We can then plot it on a truth table, and I'll do this for you very quickly. First thing you want to do is fill in the atomics. Okay, and now what you want to look out for is true premises 
and a false conclusion. If you have at least one instance of this, then the argument is invalid. So let's try to find that particular instance. So if this were a test or an exam, what I would have you do is split these up into different columns. And in fact, even this into a different column. That is the negation on one side and then the P on one side. But in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna take a shortcut here. So let's fill in the first premise, P entails Q. If both the atomics are true, then this should be true. And this is false and this is true, true. This not P, remember, takes the opposite true value of this. So we're gonna say F, F, T, T. And similarly for not Q, it takes the opposite true value of Q. So that's to say F, T, F, T. Question now is where are the rows that have true premises. Well, this one, the third row has true premises and this one has true premises. Then we look at the conclusion and we ask, okay, is there a row with a false conclusion? Well, within these rows, is there a row with a false conclusion? Indeed there is, right here. So by way of a truth table, we've now shown denying the antecedent is indeed an invalid inferential move. All right, any questions? Okay, in that case, we'll move on to our second form of fallacy. Now remember, there are two form of fallacies that you have to know. The first is denying the antecedent. That is to assert not P in the case of P entails Q. Now, what about affirming the consequent? What does that mean? So suppose your first premise is P entails Q. What would affirming the consequent fallacy consist of? Have a think. So P is the antecedent here, Q is the consequent. Now, to affirm the consequent is exactly as it sounds. You assert Q. Of course, when Q is the consequent, you assert Q. If Q was something, sorry, if the consequent is something else, say T, and then you assert T. Now, this is another common fallacy, and that's why it's been given a name. P entails Q, Q, therefore P. Does this work? Does this make sense? Well, I mean, P could be the case, but you don't know that. You don't know, you can't infer on the basis of these two premises because there might be other roots to Q. For example, W. Here's an example. If I'm Venice, then I'm in Italy. I am in Italy. That is to say, you're affirming the consequent. Therefore, I am in Venice. Well, think about that. That's not right, is it? I mean, just because you're in Italy and just because if you're in Venice, then you're in Italy, doesn't mean you're in Venice. You could be in Rome. You could be in Milan. I mean, the first premise, because it's a conditional, it can be true regardless of whether you are, in fact, in Venice. And look, our previous case study about James being fit, well, that's affirming the consequent as well. As I've said, yes, if James goes to the gym, then James is fit. And yes, maybe James is fit. But this doesn't mean that he goes to the gym because there might be ways for him to get fit that doesn't involve him going to the gym. As soon as we symbolize it, P entails Q, Q, and then therefore P, we see that it indeed doesn't follow, right? I mean, the arrow's not hitting the right way. 
it's not the case that Q entails P, it's P entails Q. Here's a visual representation of the fallacy. Again, P entails Q is noted by something like this, and you're affirming the consequence, so you're saying Q. This is super easy to see because when you say Q, what you're saying is you're within the big orange circle. But what that means is you can be found here, you can be found here, and perhaps you could be found inside the P circle as well. But just on the basis of your two premises, you don't know where you stand. Okay, now here is another truth table and we want to show the invalidity of affirming the consequent. But this time I'm gonna let you do it. So hopefully you have pen and paper on hand. I'll give you say a minute to fill this in very quickly and we'll take a look together. Now for today's purposes, don't worry about filling in all of the atomics and the logical operators. Just take the shortcut and just tell me what this conditional is. Okay, I'll give you a minute. If you're done, then write down in the chat. All right, I think you guys are a bit quick with this one. I'll give you guys 10 more seconds then. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Again, it's good to remember that for the material condition, there's only one case in which it is false, that is, if the antecedent is true and the consequent false. So it's false on the second row, but it's true for the others. Q, you know, you can just copy that over this, you can copy that over. And what's the row that's invalid? Uh, let's see, again, it's the third row here, TTF. Okay, any questions? <laughs> 